I grew up in Vero Beach, Florida, and I was raised in a place called Gifford. And of course, as a young kid, we were very, very poor. You know, my mom, she was a migrant worker. My father was working at a place called Hogan and Son Packing House. They were probably making about a dollar an hour. And during this time, you know, there was always fighting in my home where they were stabbing, cutting, my mother was shot. Of course, um, the cops came to my home and I decided that at this point that I would become a law enforcement officer because they put me aside. This was after my mom and dad just finished plunging knives into each other's body. Um, going back, you know, it was, it was so difficult for us. And as a young kid, you know, growing up in poverty, you know, I always wanted a different lifestyle. So that's when I migrated and went into doing sports. I played football, basketball. Um, I was a standout athlete in middle school as well as junior high school, as well as high school, football, basketball, and track. And of course, you know, when you grew up in the hood, a lot of people don't understand the thing that goes on in the hood, you know, and you ask yourself, you know, why is it that I'm living this type of lifestyle? Why can't I live the same lifestyle as someone else? And, you know, there was time that my mother, she threw potash. And you may say, what is potash? It's called devil, um, some type of devil oil where they mix together with pee. And when you toss it on a person, it's almost like acid, you know, and of course my dad, he'll come back. And there was one time that a gentleman touched my mother's leg. Um, it was my father's friend. His name was Mr. Knott. And of course they had this place called Under the Tree where all the adults, they get together. And there Mr. Knott was, you know, and my dad said, hey, I heard that you touched my wife's leg. And he said, well, if I touch her leg, what are you going to do? My dad said, if you tell me that you touched my wife's leg, I'm going to shoot you. And of course he said, yeah, I touched her. So of course my dad pulled the chrome um, 32 out with a pearl handle from what I was informed. And the first shot, it went by Mr. Knott head. You know, he didn't hit him. He said, you didn't shoot me. He said, no, I didn't get you that time, but I'm gonna get you this time. The second shot hit him up in his neck area. My dad, it, he did eight years in prison. You know, again, and, and growing up in the hood, you know, I always said, I didn't want to become a product of my environment, but I want my environment to become a product of who I am. You know, to go out and, and make a difference in the, in the lives of others and, and let them know that it's not about where you come from, it's where you're going at in life. And they, my family hated cops. They always had uh, some type of run-in with the cops. My dad hated cops. He hated cops with a passion. He always talked about how he would blow a cop brains out, you know, and you got to understand my dad couldn't read or write. None of my family members had a, a high school diploma on my father's side, as well as my, um, my mother's side. All the siblings, they never had a high school diploma. And you know, this is a type of area where most young kids grow up in the hood. And and when you revert back to these things, it's, it's, it's terrible, you know, and you say to yourself again, man, I'm trying to get out of here. And that's why a lot of these young athletes you see that come out of the hood, you know, they go play football, they go play basketball, they run track. It's because they're trying to, you know, escape that type of upbringing and whatnot. And when I tell you my family hated cops, they literally jumped on the cops when I was about 11 or 12 years of age. And I'm saying to myself, why, why are they jumping on the police? You know, the police are good people. And I, I remember when I was about eight or nine, 11 years of age, where um, there was stabbing and the cops pulled me aside. And I'm saying the police are good people, man. Why is my family always fighting with the cops? And of course, it just got, it just got worse. It intensified, you know. And as a young kid, again, like I said, I always wanted to be a professional football player or a basketball player or a track runner. And... You know, I finally got a, um, a scholarship where I went to um, Missouri Southern State University in Joplin, Missouri. And of course, I was a standout athlete. But if I back up for one second, I remember um, 17 years of age when I played basketball, um, there was this, a, a grocery store called Piggly Wiggly. This grocery store where they had the brown paper bag. And I asked my mom if she can give me $2, you know, just to get a hamburger and a Coke after the basketball game. I was 17 years of age when this happened. And my mom, she scraped up every nickel, dime, and quarter that she could, but she couldn't muster up $2. So she made two peanut butter sandwiches. And when she made the peanut butter sandwiches, she gave it to me, and I put them in my bag, you know, where I had my sneakers and everything. When everybody got off the bus to go into McDonald's, I actually stayed on the bus. And I never said anything to anybody about the fact that I only had just two peanut butter sandwiches. I didn't even have water. Had no money except for the little change that my mom gave me. But again, my mother have always said to me as a young kid, if you don't have it, you don't ask nobody for it. And I stayed there and it wasn't until one of the players noticed that what was going on 
And he went to the coach and said, hey, coach, listen, man, you know, Hicks don't have any money to get anything to eat. So Coach Ron Davenport, who was my coach at the time, he said, hey, Ray, listen, um, you get off this bus. You know, I'm going to pay for your I'm going to pay for your dinner from this point forward. And of course, you know, um, I went on to college and backing up again, uh, my mother, she actually had to raise up. I think it was ninety nine dollars, if I'm not mistaken. And when she put me on the bus, I had no money, no food, no water. The only thing I had was a black footlocker. And of course, um, when I got on that bus, I sat on that bus for three days and three nights. And when we, went, when we reached Nashville, Tennessee, there was an older white lady um, that saw me. She said, young man, um, I, we've been on this bus for the last three days and three nights, and I haven't seen you eat anything. And I, I you know, of course, going back to my mother, always said to me, you don't ask somebody for anything. And she said, you come here. And she gave me a bologna sandwich and a um, banana. I swear to God, that bologna sandwich tastes like a porterhouse steak at the time, you know, and I was so happy. I was so, you know, proud of the fact that, you know, this this older white lady that saw me recognized the fact that I had been on this bus for three days and three nights with her. And then she never saw me eat anything. But my mother always told me that when you don't have food, you can actually drink a lot of water and that water will actually make you feel full. So that's one of the things that I did because there's a bathroom on the bus. So, of course, I drank as much water as I possibly could. I washed up a little bit, you know, in the bathrooms, you know, to clean myself up a little bit. And when I arrived to Missouri, um, one of the coaches said, hey, where is this kid from Florida that has wheels? And I said, coach, I'm from Florida, but I don't have any wheels. And Coach Frazier said, well, well, I thought they said that you can run. I said, what, run on foot? I said, yes, let's go. You know, that's 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 a given. So, of course, we went down to the turf and um, I ran the 4-3-5-40. A four three five, and then he said, "Wait a minute, let's run this over." I ran another four three um, seven, if I'm not mistaken. Um, again, I was I was striving to come th that professional football player that I always wanted to be. Um, uh, while I was there in college, I broke all the Russian Ricky. Um, I broke all the Rus the Russian um, awards. Of course, I my junior year I went to, um, to an All American, and going back to my freshman year. I was one up for Ricky at a year award. I scored a touchdown every single game, every single game I scored. And this is where I met my, my wife at. And she was on a delayed entry program um, to go into the Navy. So I decided at this point time, I said, you know, what? Um, how are we going to keep you from going to Scotland? Because they gave her orders to go to Scotland. So she said, the only way I can not go over there to Scotland is to get pregnant. So, of course, that's when my wife and I made a um, decision that we were going to conceive a child. That's how my first daughter came about. We going back to 1986 is when she got pregnant and her ship was stationed in Pasagula, Mississippi. It was the USS Simon Lake. And of course, while I was there, um, I went and got a job at the shipyard. I was working there, you know, um, until I decided to tell my wife, hey, I'm going to go back to Florida. So there was a gentleman that my wife was in the Navy with. He sold her the car, which was a uh, 1984 Chevy Chevette. That car was so small, you, you would think that I could pick it up, you know. And um, of course, I drove it like 11 to 12 hours back to Florida. Um, I went to Fort Lauderdale. And when I went to Fort Lauderdale, I got a job as a construction worker at the 110 Tower, which is right across the street from the courthouse. And I decided that I was going to go into law enforcement. I was not going to do construction work, but I was going to go into law enforcement. And 11 17, 1986 is when I became a detention officer. And in the process of becoming a detention officer, my whole mindset was to inspire these inmates and let them know, hey, listen, I came from where you came from. You can change your life around. And there was a gentleman that I used to see coming in and out of the system. His name was Gaston Akins. We call him G Fresh. And G was out in the streets, you know, selling drugs and robbing every, all this other kind of crazy stuff. I said, G, every time you turn around, the man, the recidivism rate is continuously growing by a vast number. I said, when are you going to change your life around? What about your wife and kids, man? And he's like, man, listen, I'm trying to make it out here. I said, gee, I said, okay, well, who taking care of your kids right now? You in here, who taking care of your kids, man? You know, I said, man, you listen, you need to change your life around, man. He said, but you was one that made it out of the hood. I said, yeah. I said, but so can you, man. I said, you got to change your life around, man, you know? And of course, in 1990, since I grew up in the hood, you know, um, the sheriff department came to me and said, hey, listen, Ray, we want you to recover. And of course, they knew that I was from the street, you know, and we used to use the street lingo. Yo, my nigga, what's happening? I got them parlays, man. You know, and of course, 
um, if you're from the street, you're going to know what parlays are. You're going to know that it's cocaine rocks, but they're, they're, they're about the size of your thumb, you know, and that's what some of these, these drug addicts, they look for. So of course they, they use me and several other individuals to go out there and work. And, um, as we working, I'm actually watching these guys plant drugs, beat young offenders to the ground and take money. Um, the bar sheriff officers are manufacturing their own drugs and giving to us to be sold in the street, which is entrapment. You know, and I'm saying to myself, wait a minute, man, I didn't sign up for this. This is not right. But I'm watching them plant jaws and beat young black offenders to the ground and take money. So I told myself, listen, man, this is morally wrong and totally unethical. I'm not going to engage and indulge in this practice. So, of course, I, 1994, I started working as a drill instructor. And, of course, I went to uh, Fort McCullum Drill Sergeant School in Fort McCullum, Alabama. And this was actually a program that was implemented by the sheriff's office to help young youth from, this, from 15, at 16 years of age to 35 years of age make a decision that, hey, um, we're going to send you to boot camp. You're going to go through a regiment training for 90 days. And if upon the completion of the boot camp, it'll keep you from going to prison. So I became a drill instructor in 1994. And I inspired so many of the young kids. As a matter of fact, I was one of the hardest drill instructors that probably ever put a uniform on. The reason being because when I went through the training, drill sergeant training, it was so hard. I mean, I told my wife, I got there on a um, Sunday. I told my wife that next Thursday, I said, listen, I'm ready to get out of here, man. I can't take this here. It was so difficult. It was so hard. But the drill instructor said to me, drill sergeant McGee said, hey, if you're going to inspire somebody, if you're going to help somebody, you got to go through the same type of training that you're going to put a person through. So in a way, um, I helped again, I helped so many individuals from boot camp. A lot of those guys are doing well for themselves. Um, I received a phone call just a couple of days ago from one of the, um, the boot campers. His brother called me and said, hey, man, listen, you know, my brother loved you and everything. And um, he always spoke highly about you. I was there, you know, when he graduated with my mother. But anyway, going fast forward it. I decided to go through the Crossover Academy. When I went through the Crossover Academy in Palm Beach from correction to law enforcement, uh, my whole mindset was actually to go out and work on the streets. And of course, I went through the academy, graduated. I began to work uh, narcotics around about 1998, 1999. And as I'm working narcotics again, I'm saying to myself, I'm watching these guys plant drugs and take money. And I say, here we go again. You guys doing the same thing. I say, you know, we just, we did a buy bus. Well, we were sending informants into a, a certain particular location. And of course, the informant will actually come back after they make transaction with the subject and give us the information. Now, granted, the cocaine rocks that we was giving these, these guys was in a, a Ziploc package that had a serial number. And of course, the money was marked. So therefore, we knew that, we knew that it was our drugs and it was our money. Um, we did a sweep. We took those guys off the street. And as we begin to uh, po propose as undercover sellers, Again, I'm saying to myself, like, man, I didn't sign up for this. I'm watching these guys take thousands and thousands of dollars each and every night. And I'm saying, man, this is crazy, man. You know, um, I said, you guys are no better than the one we just arrested. You guys, you should be going to jail yourself. And they told me to mind my business. I said, what do you mean mind my business? And, and, and of course, at this particular time, they said, wait, listen, we, we're not going to have you working out here on the streets anymore. We're going to put you back in the jail. I said, I don't give a flying. You know what? You, I, start, I started in the jail anyway. So put me back in the jail. So, of course, they put me back in the jail. I worked on the sixth floor. And, and the process of working on the sixth floor, um, I dealt with a lot of uh, murderers, home invasion, um, robberies, and all these other different types of individuals that came through the system. Um, there was one time I had a fight where I had to protect the sergeant. I broke both of my hands, you know, where I had to have extensive surgery on my left hand. You know, fighting with this inmate who literally punched one of our sergeants because he didn't like him because he was a white man and, and he was on the eighth floor, maximum security. And he wanted, they told me he had to go down to general population. He said, no, I'm not going. And of course, they they called me. I come upstairs. I begin to talk to him. And next thing you know, he punched me and literally almost knocked me out. And and when I came to my equilibrium, you know, I literally I, when I punched him with my left. The, the bone went through my skin, and of course, I, I lost both of my knuckles, you know, on my right hand as well as my left. But through it all, you know, I'm saying to myself, going back to this drug thing, is that, you know, I've always felt compelled to, to speak out against the things that I see that's going wrong. And I saw a lot of things going wrong. And if I spoke up to my father and told him, listen, man, you're not going to keep beating my mother. I spoke up against the things that I saw, and I thought it was the right thing to do. Well, lo and behold, on June 15, 2000, 
um, I worked on the sixth floor. And when I came home, it was around about three o'clock. I worked from 73 and I lied down, um, took a shower, lied down. And I got up around about five, five thirty. And I decided I was going to go in the backyard with a neighbor and work out. I had over 600 some pounds in my backyard. And in the process of working out, I discovered, um, look across the street. I said, man, that's a drug task force or the SWAT team. They was mounting up across the street. So when I saw them, um, they, and they saw me, they jumped in their car, they sped down the back street. And of course, um, I said, let's go to the front of my yard. So when I go to the front of my yard, there's 60 some cops, 60 cops throwing me at gunpoint. <laughs> they had me at gunpoint. They had my kids at gunpoint. They were 12 and seven years of age. Of course, my wife had gone to Winn-Dixie, and I said to her, I said, uh, my daughter, oldest daughter, called my wife and said, Mom, they got Dad. And of course, she said, what do you mean? So by the time she get there, she started patting on her chest like she was having heart palpitations. And they said, we got a warrant for your arrest. I said, a warrant for who arrest? They were, a warrant for your arrest. I said, what did I do? So here come this black guy named Ricky Clark. He's patting me up my shoulder. Yo, Ray, just calm down, calm down. I said, man, what you mean calm down, Ricky? I said, you, you guys come here to my home telling me you got a, a warrant for my arrest? I said, what did I do? Ray, just calm down, man. So, of course, they go in my house. They rip up my house, you know, tear up my house and everything, looking for drugs and money. And Dave Robshaw from Eternal Affairs says, hey, Ray, um, we're going to place you on suspension pending the outcome this, of this case. I said, what case? What case? I said, I don't know what you guys are talking about, man. And of course, they handcuffed me, put me um, in a, one of the cruisers and transported me down to District 5. So when I arrived at District 5, I'm still asking the question, why am I here? Ray, listen, we can't discuss. I said, you, why you guys keep telling you can't discuss it? You arrested me, but you're, telling me what, you didn't, you're not telling me what I did. So of course, they booked me and they took me over to the city jail. So when they put me to the city jail, I begin to ask questions there. Why am I here? You know, can I talk to a lawyer? where they placed me in solitary confinement. And the next day, the marshals come, and I'm like, whoa, the, the marshals here? So what, why is the marshals here? And they say, hey, Ray, we're here to come take you to court. I say, take me to court for what? What did I do? And of course, they handcuffed me and shackled me. They placed me in an unmarked cruiser, transported me over to the, um, the federal courthouse. So when I get over there for arraignment, my wife and my mother sitting in the, in the courtroom, and the, the, the prosecutor said, when Mr. Hicks is at work, he's in the top 10% of his department. But when he's not at work, he's into other curricular activity. And I'm looking back at my mom and my wife and saying, what is, what, what is this woman talking about? My mom like, just calm down. I'm, I'm like, mom, I, you know, what are these people talking about, man? And of course, um, she said, when he's not at work, he's into other curricular activity. And she said, I went to various states to live in 350 kilograms of cocaine that was equivalent to $750 million. So the judge say, you're not, a, you're not a flight risk because I didn't have a passport at the time, but she said, you're a minister to society. I'm a, I'm a minister to society. I was a highly decorated officer. I was a highly decorated officer. I was a Gold Cross recipient, Silver Cross recipient, two-time deputy of the month. I've never been in trouble in my entire life. I've helped so many people change their lives around. And I'm saying, I'm a menace to society. There's something wrong with this system. Of course, the judge gave me a no bond hole. They transported me to the federal detention center down in Miami. When I arrived there, there's a certain way that you script search an inmate. And of course, I'm saying to myself, like, this is crazy, man. This is crazy, you know? Anytime you, anytime you script search an inmate, you know, it's a certain way that you script, a, a script search an inmate. You know, you ask them to lift up their tongue. If they have hair, you, they have to run their hands through their hair. Of course, you make them turn around. They have to show the bottom of their feet, and they have to bend at the waist, and they cough. 
So if, if you concealing anything in your anal, it'll, it'll pop out. And of course, these guys me in humane. And they came to me and gave me an orange jumper. And when they gave me the orange jumper, they took me up to the, the um, 13th floor, which was called the shoe, a place called the hole. I stayed there for five months. Total darkness, 23 hours a day, one hour a day for recreation. The officer was jigging at me every single day. You that effing cop, you that crooked cop, I hope you're gone for the rest of your life. And I'm saying to myself, I'm not a crooked cop. I was a highly decorated officer. They say, yeah, we heard it from everybody. You know, like these guys were so nasty. I said, you guys are so unprofessional, man. You, you guys shouldn't even beat officers. You know, your job is not to judge me based on what I'm in here for. I'm an innocent man. They say, yeah, they all say that they're innocent. And of course, it got to a point where I begin to do 1,000, 1,500 push-ups every other day or every day. Because now I remember Ray Lewis and how he did push-ups, you know, and sometimes you have to do these things in order to do what? You know, to, to position yourself and make yourself stronger because I feel like at some point I'm going to go to war, you know? And there was an emergency button inside the unit, and I constantly pushed that emergency button because now, you know, I've been in the hole for almost five months. Total darkness, you know? Uh, most people would lose their mind. It's, it was like the wall was caving in on me. You start hallucinating where you, you begin to t talk to the walls and the walls are responding. And all of a sudden, they take me down to Mr. Fernandez. This is a man that I will never forget the longest day I live. And when God blessed me, he blessed him and his family. He called me and says, Ray, why are you threatening my staff? I said, sir, I'm not threatening your staff. It's your staff that's threatening me. And he says, what's going on, man? I said, I, I haven't talked to my wife and kids since I've been here, man. I said, can you give me a phone call? So he gave me a phone call. And of course, I called my wife and kids. It was such a very emotional moment. You know, just listening to my wife and my kids, you know. Um, my wife said, Raymond, what's going on? You know, why are these people doing this to you? You know? She said, why are these people doing this to you? I said, only because I spoke out against corruption, you know? And um, so the phone call ended. And of course, um, Captain Fernandez says, Ray, the only other way you're gonna be able to speak to your, your wife and kids, um, you have to go down to the general population. I said, I don't care where you put me at. So they took me down to the general population. I get there and um, here come this black dude, about 6'2", 6'4", 270 pounds. Um, he, tell, he saw my picture parade over the newscast saying, oh, that's that effing cop. Granted, there's 120, 122 inmates in, in, in the federal um, cell, in the unit where I was, 7 West, and um, there's one officer. So one of the guys that knew me from the hood, we called him blind, but his name was Maurice from Tatertown. He said, man, you, you know who that is? He said, man, that's Big Hicks, man. He come from where we come from. He gonna thump, man. You tripping, man. So, of course, all the inmates gathered up around the door. So as I go in to put my bedroll down in the cell, I turn around. There he is in the door. So I told him, I said, listen, dude, you, you, I hate effing cops, you know. And, you know, it's amazing to me because there was eight guys in there that I had either arrested or I was over when I worked in the jail. Every last one of those guys gave me the utmost respect. Here, here's this moron going to tell me about he hate, he hate, hate effing cops. And I told him, I said, come on in here. We can handle this like men. So, of course, when he came into the unit, you know, he tried to arrest me. That's what big guys do. They try and rush you. Man, I've been fighting ever since I was six years of age. My dad taught me how to fight from the time that I was six. And my hands are good. And, of course, when he tried to rush me, I hit him with so many, with so many rights and lefts that he, when he hit, hit the ground, I literally tried to kill him. I tried to beat him to death, blood gushing from his face like a faucet. I, and the guys were like, come on, big homie, big homie, man, you're going to kill him. You know, and all of a sudden, um, the officer came up and, and everybody dispersed. Everybody just ran, you know. Of course, I lied down in my bed and I began to ask God, Lord, why me? Why me, Lord? And God said, why not you? I need a good shepherd to go get my sheep and bring them unto me. When all revenues has been exhausted, that's when I begin to manifest myself. And... Of course, the, the court appointed attorney who they appointed to me, he comes in, bring me out and he says, hey, Ray, um, listen, you faced with natural life imprisonment, man. 
And I told him, I said, I'm not faced with nothing, man. I haven't done anything wrong. Where the, I said, where's the evidence? Where's the physical evidence that they said that I went to all these various states? Well, he said, well, I need to check on that. I said, yeah, you need to check on that and come back with me, get back with me. So, of course, he checked and came back. He said, Ray, on a manuscript, write down everything that happens. He said, because it could possibly be a bestseller book, maybe a movie. His name was Marty Fagenbaum. And he took me back to court. He told the judge, he said, Your Honor, I'm getting off this case. I'm getting off this case. And, of course, the judge said, um, okay, you know, but then we'll have to sign, appoint another attorney. So they give me another attorney. With, his name was Ruben Garcia. Mr. Garcia tried to force me to take time under coercion. Ray, you know, the feds got a 98.8% conviction rate. I said, God got a, a conviction rate of 0%, and I'm going to trust the Lord, and I'm not. I said, the same thing I told Mr. Marty Fagenbaum is the same thing I'm telling you, Mr. Garcia. I'm not taking anything. I wouldn't even take time served. So it got to a point where I feel like he was trying to force me to take time for something that I did not do, that I did not do. And I told him, I said, no, I'm not going to take time. And, and, and there was time that I really wanted to come across that table and Mr. Garcia to tear, tear his head off, you know, because when you think back, my wife and kids stood in this long line, you know, unpleasant weather, whether it's raining, it was cold, it was hot, you know, waiting to come into the system. My wife had my kids uh, doing cheerleading where they had to put pins in their hair. They treated my kids like they was freaking in, incarcerated, you know, and there was time that the vending machine, I, my wife said, Raymond, I'm sorry, I don't even have a couple of dollars to get something out of the vending machine. And my kids will always ask me, hey, dad, you know, when you coming home? I said, soon. You know, six months gone by, a year gone by, a year and a half gone by, going into two years. And I'm still telling my wife and kids soon. I'm coming home soon. And of course, um, Mr. Garcia, he's still trying to force me to take time. It's a shame that a lot of these inmates, they take time to, to avoid and face an increasingly hard sentence because they cannot afford these high power lawyers. And of course, my wife. She went through her thrift savings and she was able to take out, I don't know if it was between fifteen, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 from her thrift savings. She got an attorney by the name of Michael Bloom. Michael Bloom, he was a federal prosecutor, never lost a case in 15 years. And when he went to go visit with my mother and my wife, he said, I, I know a drug dealer when I see one. And Raymond most definitely not a drug dealer. He, you know, and he said, I'm going to help him get, come home to his family. So, of course... I was glad to hear him. I was glad to hear that. And I was glad to meet with this gentleman. When he came to interview me, he said, Mr. Hicks, he said, this is a shame, man. You know, he said, I've been a prosecutor for 15 years and it's a shame what these people have done to you, but I'm going to get you out of here. And I said, thank you so much, sir. That's all I was waiting on. And I kept praying and I kept praying and I kept fasting. You know, I fast for three days and three nights. I ate no food, no water. I always just prayed and asked God to intervene in my situation. And God intervened by bringing this man into my life. On August 27, 2001, we went to trial in federal court. As I'm walking down this, lo this long corridor, you know, it felt like somebody had a razor blade cutting into my ankles. You know, my hand, I was handcuffed in front with chains running to the shackles, you know, and there I was being um, escorted to court. When I got into the courtroom and they, and they chose the jury, there was a chill that came over my body that I can't even describe to you. This chill was like, like I was in the coldest place, like Alaska, you know, with no, with no clothes on. I mean, it was freezing there, you know. And um, all of a sudden, I begin to re recite the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, you know. He will prepare a tape before me in the presence of my enemies. And as I begin to write the 23rd Psalm, the, the chill began to just fade away. And they chose 11 whites, one black, and one black alternate. All business people. And I'm saying to myself... Wow, man, this is crazy, man, you know? And so my attorney got up and he presented my case to the court and the judge, the chief judge, Judge Record, this man had a, a mustache that was rolled up at the end. He would give you a million years if he, if he found out that you're guilty. Well, he actually said, well, where are the drugs involved in this case? We have no drugs. He said, where are the money? We have no money. He said, so why is this man here? Oh, well, he gave confidential law enforcement information, FCIC, NCIC. Well, my attorney, she um, subpoenaed a communication operator, Kathy Munez. She came in and testified. She said, I've been in this capacity for 25 years. And she said, Mr. Hicks has not ran this information. And the way you run FCIC, NCIC is through a social security number. So she, of course, she said, you all, there's a certificate completion from FDLE. 
So they found out that I had not ran this information. Then they lied and said I was on audio tape. When they played the tape for the jury and the judge, they found out that it wasn't my voice on the tape, but in fact, it was the same deputy who had placed me arrest at my home. So all of a sudden, you see these guys from the Internal Affairs Division get up and run out of the courtroom. So the, the case was presented to the jury, and the jury, um, they begin to deliberate, and they came back with a not guilty verdict within 30 minutes. Of course, the chief judge allowed my wife to go to um, Tom Jink and barbecue, um, KFC, Papa John, and, they, and she brought food into the system where me and my co-defendants, we sat there and we, be, we began to eat. Well, all of us was ex exonerated, every last one of us. There was like six of us. But, you know, it's amazing to me how these people try to get me to lie on these other people just in order for them to go to jail for natural life. I said, no, I'm not lying on anybody. And it just goes to show you how the system is. They offered me a 5K1 and immunity. Well, if you testify, you know, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, test I'm not testifying against anybody. You know, I haven't done anything wrong. Me and these guys, we worked out of this warehouse, you know, and it's a shame and it's a disgrace how BSO have violated my constitutional civil rights on a constant basis, on a regular basis. You know, they searched my vehicle, a 1993 Mercedes that had expensive um, emblems on the back that said V12. They stormed into my, my car, no search warrant, theorizing that I must have been selling drugs to own a, a, a Mercedes Benz. And I'm saying to myself, this is crazy. I filed a complaint to Internal Affairs. It went nowhere. Even though I was told that they was going to conduct a thorough investigation, the, the complaint went nowhere. And it's amazing to me how the Broward Sheriff Office has a fiduciary duty that if a man or woman has committed a crime, you have to call that person in and give them a gathering statement to determine whether or not these, if, if this person or person have committed these crimes. At no time did they ever call me in and swear me in you know, and ask me if I was associated with any type of drug transaction or anything of this nature, you know, and again, they violated my rights. The union that represented me, the FOPE, they said that they didn't want to get involved. I'm saying, what do you mean? Because of the complexity of your case. I'm like, what do you mean? You're taking money out of my paycheck every two weeks to represent me, but you're telling me that you can't represent me? I'm saying to myself, this is crazy, man. So the union wouldn't even represent me. So again, you know, it goes to show you that, you know, when you don't have money, you know, a lot of people just give up, you know, but there's no giving up with me, you know, and, and, and fast forwarding. So of course I come home, the jury deliberate, come back, not guilty verdict. I come home and my wife is telling me about how things have intensified. Granted, while I was an inmate, she told me how she was falling behind on everything, you know, the house, the cars, um, she had to go pawn her ring that I, I got, I, I paid that K jeweler for almost two years, three years, you know, a two carat diamond ring. She had to pawn that for $700. You know, we had to liquidate everything that we had. Why? Because, you know, it, it was just, we was a destitute at this time. So of course my Sergeant James Booker, he came to me and he says, Hey Ray, man, listen, I'm, him and his wife, Atlanta. He said, man, I'm here. I'm trying to, I want to help you, man. What can we do? And he gave me, before we was evicted out of my home, he gave me $2,286.24. And I thanked him. You know, and when you talk about a supervisor, man, this man is one of the people that I love and I respect. And I will always respect him to the longest day I live, him and, him and his family. You know, and that's what a supervisor is for. To stand up and be there for a person when you're going through these type of situations. You know, and, don't, and, and not to formulate an opinion about a person, but in a way, um, of course, I'm there and, and I'm watching my wife and kids. We're suffering right now. I mean, we have people knocking at our door. Hey, I give you 3000 to turn over your, your deeds. I give you 2500 to turn over your deeds. Come to find out I had over $78,000 of equity in my property, you know, and we went to a friends of ours. You know, we thought we were friends of ours. They mistreated us. You know, they took $53,000 of that money. And I'm just saying to myself, like, wow, man, this is crazy. Eventually, we was, we was evicted out of our home, cars repossessed. And all of a sudden, uh, again, the sheriff office come again a second time. They stormed the house before we was evicted and say, hey, uh, this guy, you know, he, they said I was shooting at someone. And I'm saying, how, wait a minute, shooting at someone, six of cops stormed my home again. Then wrote my house off, yellow tape everywhere. So there was a sergeant named Bernard McCorms that was down the street from me. He said, I just saw Ray and Treese in the, in the elevator. I just saw them in the elevator. How could they say he's a shooter? 
So he said, man, these people tripping. So here come this black dude. He telling me, put your effing hand behind your back. I said, man, if you put your freaking hands on me, one of us going to leave here today. One of us going to leave here today if you put your freaking hands on me, man. And my neighbor, Lisa, came across the street. She said, Ray, come on, man. Don't do this, man. I said, man, this freaking guy. And, and Dave Robson, Dave told this guy, Robson, say, man, you know what that is? That's Deputy Hicks, man. He was one of the best. And there I am handcuffed for about six hours in my backyard. The freaking handcuffs cut into my skin. You know, I told my wife, I said, go show this gentleman. Uh, there was a white guy came in the yard. I, he was either a lieutenant or a captain. And I told my wife, I said, go show him the documents showing that we was in court. My wife presented the documents to him within seconds. Sixty some cops dissipated. They were gone within seconds. You know, he found out that I was in court. Later on, they, they sent me a, a, a charge through the mail saying I discharged the firearm. I took that case to trial in um, Deerfield before Stephen DeLuca, Honorable Stephen DeLuca in Deerfield. And he says, what a victim. We don't have a victim. He said, did you do a ballistic test? No. Where the bullet casing? He said, we don't have any bullet casing. So he says, okay, so where's the officer that generated this probable cause affidavit? He no longer worked for the department. He said, well, you the state. So the state act for a continuous. He says continuous is denied. We're going to proceed with trial. So within 10 minutes, I was tried by the courts and I was acquitted by the judge. So fast forward, I begin to fast and pray again. You know, I went into the community. I got a job working in boot camp, helping, helping um, underprivileged kids, misdirected underprivileged kids. I win this award in 2004. Uh, Mr. Jim Moran, he's a, he was a philanthropist, Southeast Toyota um, distributor. He gave an award to the uh, blacks who goes out in the community to make a difference. And of course, I won that award in 2004. If you go to AfricanAmericanAchievers.com, you're going to see me there in 2004 as one of the drill instructors that won this um, education award. And all of a sudden, the Brown Sheriff Office, they stormed my home again. This is the third time. This time, they're looking to kill me. But they, they didn't realize my 18-year-old daughter was there and my four-year-old son was there. And of course, I said, what is this about? We got a warrant for your arrest. I said, a warrant for my arrest for what? We can't discuss it. I said, what do you mean you can't discuss it? I said, here you guys go again, man. You know, you're saying you got a warrant for my arrest, but you can't discuss it. But little did they know, I had built an intimate relationship with the Lord. And I told him, I said, you got a job to do. And when I went to go try and put my arms behind my back, I was about 292 pounds. So Robert Crumb said, listen, man, Hicks going to need a double set of cups. So the sergeant told him, F that, put the effing cups on him. So, of course, he said, man, he can't get the cuffs on him. So, of course, they got into a verbal confrontation that literally almost led to a, a physical altercation. So, of course, they, gave, they, they got two sets of cuffs and handcuffed me. And then he said, go get the shackles. I said, what's the purpose of the shackles, Sarge? Oh, Ray, you're a big guy. We don't want any problem. I said, Sarge, if it was going to be a problem, it would have been a problem a long time ago. But you got a job to do. So they put me in the um, unit. They transported me down to booking. When I arrived the book and they got 20 some officers there, 20, 25 officers there in black gloves on waiting on me. So there's a gentleman by the name of Richard Lee, who I actually helped get on with the Broward Sheriff Office in detention. And he stayed there because he said, man, if that's Hicks, man, I can calm him down. So when I arrived there, I'm standing, I'm standing there in the Sally Port and I'm talking to this young lady named Figueroa that I went through the crossover Academy with. So her and I, we begin to talk about our family, talk about the Lord and everything. And, of course, I said, Lee, what did, they, what did they arrest me for? He said, they arrest you for child abuse. I said, child abuse? I'm like, wait a minute. I never even touched my own kids, man. What child have I abused? He said, what's strange is that on the PC, there is no, there is no victim. So he said he brought it to the sergeant's attention in booking. And the sergeant said, hey, man, listen, you know, this was done administratively. I have nothing to do with this. So the, the prosecutor did a thorough investigation. She threw the case out, no process. And when she threw the case out, no process, okay, of course, I'm saying to myself, man, this, this is a shame, the harassment that's been given to me by my former department, a place that I put my life on the line each and every single day. And lo and behold, um, things just intensified for me. We was evicted out of the house. We was given 24 hours to get out of my home. My cars were repossessed. You know, um, I couldn't even feed my family. I was applying for food stamps, unemployment. I couldn't get it. Um, I finally got a job with, from an inmate. The same guy I spoke to you all earlier about, his name was Gaston Akins. He actually went to prison three times. But when the third time, I, if I'm not mistaken, he actually got a job in construction. He became a foreman. And he heard that I needed a job. He gave me a job. 
and he went to his boss, Kelly Day, and the company was called Installed in Construction. And he says, Ray, I don't know if you want to do this kind of work, man, but if you're willing to do this kind of work, I'll give you a job. He gave me a job as a laborer. He became my boss. You know, I was making $9 an hour putting down soil ladders and water services. And I did that for quite, I don't know how many months, about eight months, nine months that I did that. And I kept applying for different jobs in law enforcement. It was all turned down. Even though I, I applied for 15 jobs in various places, all my efforts were turned down because of the fact of my background. And, and it's amazing to me how when you go apply for these jobs, they ask you, have you ever been arrested? And if you check yes, you got to explain to them and give supporting documentation to show that, you know, you was innocent of what they accuse you of. And this is a thing that I did for years, for years. So finally, I was able to get my G license, my D license, and I began to be, um, do bodyguard work. One of the guys, he was a former police officer. He knew about me. He says, Ray, man, he said, I got a job for you. I said, okay, what is it? He said, um, doing per personal protection. And I said, okay, no problem. I, I do that, you know. One of my first clients was Kanye West. And of course, my biggest principal was Princess Fahada. She was the daughter from, um, of King Abdullah from Saudi Arabia. And she has five sons who are all prince. And I worked for a company called Carlson Associate out of Virginia. Paul Carlson was the um, CEO and Tom Loman was the vice president. And I, tr I traveled around the, the United States protecting these individuals. And they said, Ray, where do you come from? You know, they said, man, you, I, you, 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 you're different, you know. And it's amazing to me how um, I'm working with the, these people who father was like, had so much money that it's not even funny. You know, and I'm, I'm saying to myself, but my job was to provide a service to them, you know, and of course I traveled all around the United States with them. We went to um, Beverly Hills, California. We stayed at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel for about 30 days. I, I, um, we went to the Chicago. Um, I stayed at the Peninsula in Chicago. We went to New York. I stayed at the Ritz Carlton there and I was gone for about maybe six months. And it was one of the, I guess God was taking me away you know, from Fort Lauderdale, just to get me away from the scene and also to help my family, you know, financially, because we were struggling immensely. You know, again, I wouldn't wish this on my worst enemy. I started drinking. I never took a drink a day in my life, you know, and there was time that I went into the, the liquor store and some of the guys that knew when they like, Big Hicks, what are you doing in here? And I told myself, oh, it's a party to speak, man. You know, I want to, you know, help out. But I was lying. You know, I lied because of the fact that I didn't want them to know that I was in there buying alcohol for myself. You know, I had to be honest with myself. So a lot of times you have to look in the mirror and identify yourself and find out who you are. And, you know, I just but I thank God for a lot of people who have actually given me this opportunity. Mark is one of them. I tell the brother when I first saw him and I love you, man. You know, Matthew Cox, you know, I told him the same thing. Uh, Miss Jane Turner, Mr. Tom Devine, Mr. Robert Ward, Mr. Terry Watson. Mr. Bobby Ladegar, Mr. Mike Zoomer. There's so many different people that God has put me in contact with to bring forth my story. One of the things that Ms. Jane Turner, former FBI, said to me, 26 years, and she was a SWAT member, and she was a supervisor. She said, Ray, I know you're telling me the truth. She said, because if you was moving that kind of weight, the DEA, the FBI, the marshals, and ATF would have been all over you. She says, I know yet you're telling me the truth. And she said, you know what? She said, you're not a criminal. She said, you're not a criminal, you're a hero. And there was a gentleman by the name of Hugh Thompson that fought in the war. And they was killing innocent people. And Mr. Hugh Thompson, they classified him as a snitch and everything else. And I read up about him. And even though they said he was a snitch, he said, I, I'm turning the guns on my own people. He said, because he saved over 5,000 lives. And lately, they refer to him as a hero. You know, there's a lot of heroes inside. <laughs> 21 years. 21 years I've been fighting this fight.
And it wasn't until I got in contact with these people that I just mentioned, Mark, you know, Matthew and all these other people, man, to allow me to come and speak to you all and tell you about my life. Um, you don't have to trust my word. You, you can Google me, you know. I've done nothing but help people all my life. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Because I remember as a young kid how difficult things for, were for me. I didn't go in law enforcement to belittle, belittle degrade people. I went in law enforcement to make a difference. And I can tell you, I made a difference. You know, there was a situation in um, 1990. How do you go from being a highly decorated officer to an inmate faced with natural life imprisonment? It doesn't add up. That same sheriff that put me through the things that I'm explaining to you, Sheriff Ken Jenny, he had to serve two years of incarceration. He was arrested for wrongdoing. And 1999, I won the Gold Cross Award doing an armed carjacking. This guy, he robbing the taxi cab driver. I don't know it's a robbery. I just see these guys fighting. The car merged into the fence. And lo and behold, I'm like, let me stop and break up the fight. I discovered they wrestling over 357 Magnum. One round went through the roof of the car. The subject took a chunk out of the victim's eye. And, but I managed to take the gun from him. I got on the phone, call communication, advising signal 041, you know, to set up a perimeter. They arrested this 18-year-old. Come to find out, he got in the taxi off of Sistrunk, and they took him off of 21st, um, 21st Ave in Oakland Park. He went up to the apartment, according to the report, retrieved the gun, came back downstairs, and made the taxi cab driver get in, in the passenger seat. And I, I, they happened to be coming down the street, and when the light was red, I was there in civilian clothing, and, I, and when the light turned green, the taxi cab went merged into the fence. And I, I saw the two of them wrestling outside the car. So I said, let me just break up this fight. And again, I discovered they wrestling over 357 Magnum. Here it is, you know, I'm saving a life, which is my own life, you know, to help somebody else. When I was an inmate, I won a life-saving award, you know? And it's amazing to me how the warden of the institution, she gave me a life-saving award. When I worked for Crown Processing Center in Miami, you know, I won a life-saving award after a gentleman hung himself because they was going to deport him back to his country. You know, and, but it's a shame. Even when I worked for the Department of Homeland Security, Immigration Customs Enforcement through Doria and ACAL JV, you know, I went, I went to a lieutenant within one year, a captain in another year. And I was a, I was a SWAT commander for ICE, Immigration Customs Enforcement, our DCT team, the Disturbing Control Team. All of a sudden, I was given the task to do a, a thorough investigation. As I do, did this investigation, they said that there was an administrator that was married to an inmate. And of course, what did I do? I, I turned in the file, come to find out she did marry an inmate. That person later became an administrator. What she did, she fired me, said I falsified the timesheet for, for 10 minutes. I had to go to a brother by the name of King, Anthony King. That's another brother that I love and respect, man. You know, this brother, man. He's another one, like my sergeant, man. This dude, King have helped so many people, man. So many people. And I went to him out of desperation. And I said, King, I said, can you loan me some money, man? You know, I couldn't even pay my rent. This brother, he said, man, if you're willing to drive down to Homestead, I got you, man. And of course, he gave me over $2,000. Then he turned around and gave me another $800. Then he turned around and gave me another thousand some odd dollars, you know. And it just goes to show you that when you're a good person, man, when people see you going through situations, they'll come and help, man. And I'm hoping and praying that one day, you know, that I would be able to help other people, man. You know, I, that's, that's all I ever wanted to do because there was people that helped me. You know, I talk about Miss Fagan. She's another one, her and her family. They went down the street and gave my wife $6,000. But when BSO gave me my back pay, I gave her money back to her. I went and got a cashier check and I gave the money back to her. You know, it just goes to her and her family. It just goes to show you that in life, man, if you're a good person, you know, people find out what you're going through, but it's a shame and it's a disgrace. And since I've been doing these interviews, so many cops have actually reached out to me. And let me just say this to you, is that there are a lot of cops that's actually working in law enforcement that are reluctant to even speak about the things that they see that goes on within these departments because it becomes detrimental to them, their family. There's um, re retaliation, humiliation, harassment, and, and it's a shame and it's a disgrace. You know, I'm a to this day, I still love law enforcement. 
I tell it to anybody. To this day, I still love law enforcement. There are so many men and women that goes out there to make a difference, to set the tone and the precedent for the people. I remember when I was eight or nine years of age, my mother just finished stabbing, plunging knives into each other's body, and I'm saying to myself, you know, they come there and pull me away from the scene. Hey, little man, come here, let me talk to you. They show me about the, telling me about the gun, the importance of the gun, the, you know, the blackjack that they had with the leather strap, with the still at the end, you know, the handcuffs. So I always said if I didn't play professional football, I would be a, a law enforcement official. And, you know, it's amazing to me, man, and, and things just intensify. You know, I, as I tell you about my life and my life story, you know, I wrote this book titled I'm Still Standing by Raymond Hicks, and that book has gone viral. You know, so many people have reached out to me that I don't even know from abroad. You know, and it's a shame, it's a disgrace that I've been speaking to some of the top officials, asking them for help. Politicians, commissioners, state attorney, and the churches, the mega churches, and all these other individuals that I've been reaching out to, nobody will help me. But God brought Mr. Mark in, in, into my life. He brought Mr. Matthew Cox into my life and all these other individuals that I've mentioned. Why? Because the story has to be told. Am I bitter? I'm not bitter, you know, I'm not bitter. You know, when you see, I'm crying because, you know, I worked my way out of the hood, man. You know, a lot of young kids are actually in the hood, you know, and, and a lot of people don't even know what goes on in the hood. But I didn't want to become a product of my environment. I want my environment to become a product of who I am, you know. I mean, you look at Colin Kaepernick, that guy. Look what happened to him when he spoke out again, police brutality, corruption, all this other stuff. He lost his career. You know, this is the type of stuff that you go through. You know, and I'm telling my kids, you know, it's amazing to me, man. I'm, they like, Daddy, you know, do you think that if you had not said anything? I said, well, why would I sit back and see these people doing these things, man, and not say something about it? I said, it's not, it's not right. It's not right. It's just, you know, it's, it's, it, listen, I didn't take on this job for this here, you know. But I must say to you that my daughters, who was 12, 7, and my son was 4, well, let me just tell you that they're doing well for themselves, you know. My daughter is, both of them are school teachers. My oldest daughter getting ready to get her doctorate degree at Nova Southeast University. She's going to get her master's. And she got a master's at um, Nova Southeast University. She got a master's at um, FAU at Florida Atlanta University. My youngest daughter, Raven, she's a school teacher. She got her degree from Florida a &M University. My son, who just turned 20, he worked for the Department of Homeland Security. And, and, you know, it's amazing to me, my wife and I, I've been married for 37 years now. We've been together for 39 years. I can't tell you how that woman suffered, man. <laughs> most, most women would have just said, listen, I'm done. I'm out. Most women would have walked away. They would say, man, I don't want nothing else to do with this. I'm done. But she stood by me through thick and thin, you know. She worked six days a week, seven days a week. They have to support my family, you know, and, th and that's another thing. But sometimes God has to bring you to the Lord's point of your life. So for you to see who everybody is that you see that's around you, because when you at the highest point of your life, this is when you come to, you don't, you don't see these people. It's when you at the lowest point of your life that you realize, you come to the realization who certain people are. And as I stated to you, you know, there was several other people, man, that started taking up a little money for me, even masonry, you know, uh, masonry turned their backs on me. I had my wife go to them out of desperation. They turned their backs on me. But, you know, and I said to myself, and, and I'm, I was a mason in Prince Hall, you know, proud of Hollywood, 690. And I'm saying, how, how is it that you guys don't, you wouldn't help my wife? Well, you know what? I have never been affiliated with masonry since that time. It's been 20 some years now. But I must mention to you, I joined Phi Beta Sigma of Gamma Gamma Sigma. And one, of, and one of the hardest things I've ever been through, but let me just tell you this, man, within one year, I won two awards that has never been done in the history of Phi Beta Sigma. And I'm still helping young kids. I have a, a foundation called the Raymond L. Hicks LLC Foundation. And I've helped so many young kids. For the last 10 years, I muster up a little bit of money and I go out to the parks, I buy book bags, school materials. Um, it's a big cookout. Uh, we give clothes, shoes, and it's an event that we have almost every year. And I've been doing that for the last 10 years. Why? It's to give back to the community. You know, this is the right thing to do. Um, feeding the homeless. You know, we go out and we feed the homeless. You know, and it's just amazing to me how God is using me to do what?
to inspire other people. And I'm hoping and praying that this video will go viral and, and it will actually inspire all of you all that's out there that's going through trials and tribulations that which is adversity, but adversity build character. It makes you stronger. It brings you closer to a higher being. You know, some people say, well, I know God, but do you really know God? Do you really know God? Because when you at the lowest point of your life, with the things I just explained to you, let me tell you something. Most people would give up. Most people would have given up a long time ago. Most people couldn't even go through a fraction of what I've been through. But I truly believe that God chose me. You know, there's, there's eagles. You know, I refer to people as being an eagle and a lion. You know, but I'm, I'm, I'm like a dove. I'm humble as a dove. But when it comes down to fighting, I'm like a lion. When it comes down to an eagle, I go into storms. That's what the eagle does. The bold eagle goes into the storm. Why? Because the storm takes the eagle higher. So I've been asking God repeatedly to take me higher so I can be able to help other people. Ray, let, let me ask you one question. Um, after, after your story, I mean, obviously you're dealing against police corruption and you were an honest man your whole life, it seems. What, what, how do you keep your faith in humanity after going through all this? Well, the reason why I keep my faith in humanity is because even my doctor, um, Dr. Jeffrey Mark said to me, Ray, he asked me the same question. How do you keep your faith in humanity after everything you've went through and everything you've described to me, you know? And I told him, I said, you know, there's a lot of great people that's out there. Just, you just haven't heard my story, you know? And how I keep my faith in humanity, answer your question mark, is because of people like yourself. You know, you don't know me, I don't know you, but yet still, I'm here telling my story. So my, at some point, my story would get out there to the right people. You know, when I came into contact with Mr. Um, Tom Devine, Mr. Robert Ward, Mr. Terry Watson, Ms. Jane Turner, Ms. Anna Popovich, Ms. Victoria, you know, Ms. Sarah, Ms. Jackie Garrett, <laughs> Mr. Mike Zoomer, Mr. Bobby Latigar, all these different people that God has put me in contact with, you know, and let me know that they're, they're, I have to continue to have faith in humanity because I know that there's some people out there that's going to see this video and they're going to come to my rescue. They're going to come to my aid. You know, it, God works in mysterious ways. And it's my relationship with the Lord that got me to where I'm at right now. So that's what that's that's the most important thing that keeps my faith in humanity is because God says, repay no evil for evil. Romans 12, 17, it says, I'll repay, said the Lord. So a lot of times when we going through these trials and tribulation, it's, 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 it's for us to go through to help somebody else. So I use my life as a testimony. And even though it hurts, it hurts so deeply, it cut deeply, but I know that it can help somebody else. So many people have reached out to me and says, Ray, man, even cops have reached out to me. They on the urge of giving up. You know, just the other day I talked to a brother, Jason, he wanted to give up, you know, and again, faith in humanity. I know that things are going to work out for me. Why? Because God have already shown it to me. And that's why the word says, repay no evil for evil. And by doing so, God said, vengeance is mine. I repay, said the Lord. He said, if your enemy is thirsty, give him a drink. If he's hungry, you know, give it to him. Why? Because it's like taking hot coals and placing them on the top of the head. No weapon that forms against me shall prosper, Mark. So my faith is in people like yourself, my doctors, you know, my friends, James Booker, Anthony King, and a lot of other brothers and sisters that I've come in contact, you know, Miss Fagan, her family, my family, my mother, my wife, my kids. I've seen them grow, come from nowhere to look where they are right now today. Look where I'm sitting here. Most people would have, I've had cops tell me, man, I would have killed myself. Wait, really? Why would you say that? Oh man, I've lost everything. So to answer your question, Mark, you know, how I keep my faith in humanity, is because of the fact that there are people out there like yourself, like Matthew Cox and a lot of other different people, you know, that gives us an opportunity to even speak about what happened because now that lets me know that guess what? The word of God says, Hebrews 11 chapter said, faith is a substance hope for evidence of things that's not seen. So to answer your question is you never knew me. I never knew you, but through my faith is what got me here. That's what got me here is my faith, belief in God, because I kept praying. I kept fasting. 
for 21 years now. And look what my faith have got me. I kept praying and asking God, Lord, send somebody to help me. Send someone to help me and my family. And all of a sudden, God put me in contact with Mark. God put me in contact with Matthew. God put me in contact with all those other individuals that I mentioned earlier. Mr. Jeremiah Johnson, he offered me a job working in New York and corrections. He said he had direct contact with Mr. Um, Serpico. So to be honest with you, I know that my faith has made me get to the level where I'm at today. But if I didn't have faith, so my faith in humanity, I know that I, I knew that at some point in contact with the right people. And I truly believe, Mark, sitting here today, speaking with you on this interview, it was my faith that got me here. It was my prayer to the Lord that got me here, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that's why I thank God each and every day. And I will continue to make a difference, man. So, you know, again, I can't give up on humanity. I mean, you know, it's, it's, that's the wrong thing to do, you know. And if you say you got faith, some people say they got faith. Do you really have faith? You got to ask yourself that. You got, you got religious people, people in the church that said, I got faith. You have faith? Well, let me, let me test you and see if you have faith. Go through, go through what I've gone through and, and let me know that your faith is still there. My faith is still here. From the time that I was rested and been humiliated to this point, I kept the faith. So I, I, I truly believe that at some point, you know, God will use me to help others. Beautiful story. Thank you, sir.